Well, thank you very much indeed for giving me the opportunity to present the results of the project today. Um, as we've heard, it's been four years of work now. The project was really conceived back in um, 2011 when we knew the centenary was approaching. Um, we knew there were a lot of wrecks, uh, particularly in the Solent area from the First World War, and indeed had done some archaeological work on a small number of those. Um, but at that time we didn't realise quite how dense that resource would be across the whole of the south coast. Um, so today I'm able to present to you the results of our archaeological work, a lot of historical research in the archives, and also I'm going to show you some of the education and outreach work we've been um, undertaking as part of the project as well. As we know, there's been a huge number of commemorative events ongoing across the UK, UK and indeed um, across the globe. And as uh, we heard in the introduction, a lot of those are inevitably focused on that war um, on the front. Um, and don't always consider many of the broader aspects of the war at sea. Jutland and of course the large naval battles um, have been uh, relatively high profile. But our project is looking at the stories of everyday um, heroism and sacrifice that were going on right off the shores of the UK and just quite how close that came um, to, to our shores. And we knew that there was a story to tell there. Thankfully, the Heritage Lottery Fund agreed and they provided the funding for the project. With that funding came a number of different objectives um, for heritage, um, for people and communities. <coughs> I'm not going to read all of those out, but that involved um, raising awareness and using the historical and documentary archives, <coughs> undertaking archaeological investigation. Um, we also had a large volunteer component with the project, um, volunteer involved in all aspects. Um, and again, producing more legacy and commemorative resources. So how have we delivered these outcomes? Um, we've been a huge documentary archive research programme in the National Archives, but also using many online resources which are becoming more and more widely available now. Um, again, um, our, our amazing army of volunteers have been involved with helping uh, research the vessels, um, their histories and their crews. We've undertaken diving field work on wreck sites from uh, Devon right across to um, East Sussex during the four years, um, photographed, measured, videoed um, a number of different wreck sites. <coughs> We've also been uh, recording in the coastal and terrestrial zone, uh, often on the muddy foreshores and in quite remote locations. Um, although I'm going to focus largely on the wreck component of the project today, we've been surveying <coughs> um, wireless stations, harbours, ports, jetties, um, also seaplane stations. So it was interesting to see Hunter's uh, image of the Pensacola 1914 station. Uh, for during the war, a network of those grew along uh, around the UK to support the war at sea. And we've been looking at a number of these um, infrastructure sites that had such a key role in supporting the war. In total, we've undertaken field work on 62 different sites during the four years, which have resulted in um, archaeological uh, reports, which are all available online. Of course, we've collected a wide variety of data from archaeological sketch plans, detailed measured surveys, um, photographs, and all of this information uh, brought together for analysis. Many hundreds, indeed thousands, of underwater photographs from wreck sites, um, <coughs> employing photogrammetry for, for, um, on the sites, which have developed very large data sets. With um, diving limited to, we had nine weeks of diving within the four years, and so inevitably there were only so many sites that we could uh, manage to get to physically with diving. So we have also been using geophysical survey data sets. We haven't collected any ourselves, but we've been fortunate to be given access to a number of different data sets, um, and in particular, uh, the high-resolution bathymetric data set from the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, uh, provided by the UK Hydrographic Office, has produced some of these um, amazing images of sites on the seabed um, that we see here. And during the project, we've extracted about 200 um, images of different wreck sites. We have also been recording artefacts from First World War wrecks. Uh, we haven't recovered any artefacts ourselves, but um, as we know, there's been a lot of artefacts recovered in the past. Those have both been public and private collections. Um, and so we've been undertaking recording of about 718, I think, was artefacts um, which 
the kind of through digital records are kind of virtually reuniting with information about uh, the wreck sites that they've come from. And so our research and field work's all been brought together into a project uh, data set, uh, in a database. Um, as you can see here, around 1,100 uh, wrecks featured along the south coast. I will just say that this distribution reflects our study area. Um, they do continue beyond the spread of dots, but although we had four years, we knew that we were only going to be able to do so much work in that time period. Um, and as you can see, with 1,100 wrecks to uh, consider, that's still been quite an undertaking. Those include known wrecks that have been located on the seabed, recorded historical losses, um, a few post-war losses in there uh, due to their significance of their role in the war, um, and also a number of coastal sites. These aren't just dots on the map and statistics. Um, we've already heard today some of the some fascinating case studies from uh, First World War wrecks. But I think it's important to remember that this was a time when we had a whole range of vessels, sailing vessels working next to uh, sailing <coughs> ships of all and variety of sizes. <coughs> and within our data set off the South Coast, we have examples of pretty much every type of ship um, that was being used during that time. But air power, again, as we've heard, is growing at this time, and so there are. <coughs> A number of airships that were lost at shoot, um, and also First World War uh, seaplane tender as well. And so, how do we make all this information available and accessible? Well, one of the key outputs from the project has been um, our online map viewer. I hope some of you would have seen this already. Uh, it was launched uh, last month, and this really gives public access to everything that we've uh, gathered during the project. It's been developed in. Uh, Designed and developed in-house by my colleague Brandon Mason, um, and he's made this so you can access uh, huge different types of data and all our reports and um, photographs. Just to provide a small example of how you can use this database, um, also if you visit the site there is a tutorial that you come across first uh, to help you guide you around, but you are able to search by uh, individual vessels so you know the name of the site that you would like to know information about. You can search in um, the left-hand panel. This was just a, in one example of the Alonia, which is off the uh, East Sussex coast. And within the data set that pops up, there's a detailed menu on the right-hand side where you have buttons with statistics and information about the site, size of the vessel, port of departure, where it was heading, um, armament, that sort of type of information. Seabed remains, description, plot of the geophysical survey image. Um, the circumstances of the loss, how it was lost during the war, and then links to all the different types of resources, photographs, artifacts, site reports, uh, video, and 3D models, all accessible uh, through there. You have a range of quite powerful uh, search tools, which means this is, as a research resource, you can start asking all sorts of different questions of the data. Um, in ter terms of searching, you can choose to search by uh, vessel type, uh, here on the top left hand side, I've just searched uh, for submarines within the data set. So the black dots are the distribution of the submarines. Uh, other options here you can um, the flag or nationality of the vessel. You can decide to see on site reports. So here I've turned on um, sites with video resources attached to them. And this one here is the uh, southwestern, one of our uh, local sites of the south, east, uh, south coast of the Isle of Wight. And the video pops up in the uh, right hand menu. Likewise, if you choose to see the 3D models, they will um, appear in that panel as well. Other options, cause of loss, use at time of loss, and you can also um, search by period as well. And you can mix all of these uh, search functions, so to start doing some quite sophisticated um, sifting of that data. So just having a quick look at some of the statistics behind this data set um, as a whole. Uh, losses by year, um, of course 1917 in the period of unrestricted submarine warfare, huge numbers of losses there. Those begin to reduce slightly in 1918 with the success of a number of the anti-submarine measures and as the tide of the war begins uh, to turn. We can look at nationality of the wrecks in the study area, of course many British wrecks, also French and German, uh, but quite surprisingly 10% of the data set are Norwegian vessels. Um, they were playing a large role in uh, the cargo trade and ensuring uh, movement of cargo during the war, and so quite a number lost um, in our study area. 
Just looking at those in the list that are represented under the other categories, these really do show the global, oops, sorry, global nature of the war um, with the range of different countries that are represented. Type of vessel, many of those steamships, um, but as we saw from the uh, montage of pictures earlier, quite a number of sailing vessels um, still in that data set, almost 25% of uh, those vessels um, that we have. Also a number of, uh, as I mentioned, almost every type of vessel that was in use at the time in the data set. What they were being used for when they were lost, um, commercial cargo vessels make up a large number of proportion, um, and also, um, of course, other uses during the war. We've, the categories here have been used to help different areas that we've been researching uh, during the project. Looking at cause of loss, um, torpedo, of course, um, scuttled, mined, uh, many vessels lost to those uh, various uh, causes. Also still a number of foundering, again, I think that links back to the number of sailing vessels, which um, despite all the other wartime hazards are still at the mercy of the weather as well. So uh, we're in Wales today, so um, I went into the data set and did a quick search of um, vessels that were related to the coal ports in Wales. So the green dots show those that were carrying coal from Welsh ports um, and were lost in our study area. The red dots show the site, the wrecks that were travelling back towards Wales um, in ballast. Many of these wrecks were travelling to France um, and helping to sustain the war effort, but also that coal was going uh, from Wales much further afield as well. Um, just a few examples, um, there were vessels travelling to Aden, Alexandria, Algiers, Bombay, Buenos Aires and Italy, just as a few of those that were, that were represented within those green dots travelling out of Wales. So we can start to um, mine that data for all sorts of um, different search uh, parameters. And just looking again at the types of craft involved in that coal trade, um, in the top left, that's uh, the Little Mystery, um, was carrying uh, coal from Cardiff towards Cherbourg when it sank in uh, 1917. It was approached by a submarine. Uh, essentially, they all had to abandon the vessel and it was um, uh, blown up um, at sea. The remains of that one haven't been found on the seabed, um, but we do have a number of, particularly the larger steamships uh, that were carrying coal from Wales. On the right hand side, that's the Fortune. Um, one of the vessels that was built with the, as the government's uh, standard building, shipbuilding program um, to increase the number of cargo vessels available, that one was built in uh, America. And this one, uh, the Globe Lift on the bottom, the bottom uh, here, added this one in, another cargo vessel full of coal from Wales, but uh, it's one of the geophysical images in the survey data sets where we've got the historical records that say the torpedo uh, hit midship um, before sinking, and it's one of the ones where exactly on the seabed you can really see clearly uh, where that torpedo damage is, uh, to, and compare that back to the um, historical record. Um, it's been really hard to choose uh, the case studies to present here today. Um, a bit like uh, Ian this morning, I've chosen some of the examples of them slightly more ordinary um, rather than some of the, for instance, there are no, we've got large naval uh, wrecks within the study area. Um, this one here is the SS Eleanor, which was a tramp steamer. Um, it was really <coughs> represents the story of the Merchant Fleet Auxiliary because it was hired by the Admiralty to carry cargo. It had a un relatively unusual cargo of mines on board when it sank. Um, and also equipment related to um, depth charges as well. There was only one survivor from this shipwreck, which I'll mention shortly. At the start of the project, there were no known photographs of this shipwreck, but um, we were uh, thankfully able to find uh, the, this uh, image of the uh, wreck during the project. So the manifest for the ship um, shows uh, they had two main types of mine on board as well as a whole range of other um, depth charge and mine related equipment. At the time that loss represented £170,000 worth of loss and in today's money that's £63 million worth of cargo. Um, I think this really shows the economic impact of the loss. Um, the number of mines on board 
there were 100, uh, sorry, 1,400 mines on board the emigrant, Helena. <laughs> At that time, 6,800 mines were being laid by the British per month. So the loss of this one vessel meant the loss of around 20% of the uh, mine capability for that month. So quite a strategic uh, loss shown with this site as well. On the seabed, relatively well preserved. Um, the torpedo hit a midship, so it's slightly more broken up um, in that area. Forward and aft, really well, uh, relatively well preserved. Um, hopefully you can see here that even the boilers still sat on their cradles on the seabed. Um, we've undertaken an archaeological survey of the site. Um, that includes uh, this cargo of mines that I was mentioning. So the photograph shows the mine and the, uh, with the associated uh, square sinkers. And on the seabed on the wreck, very obviously you can directly compare the cargo of mines still packed uh, within the forward hold. It's just a uh, top diagram shows how the mines deployed um, once they were um, at sea. So we can start directly comparing this archaeological evidence back to the cargo manifest. I mentioned um, loss of life. Only one surviving member of the crew really shows the uh, human loss associated with the war. Uh, Barton Hunter, um, he was found floating on part of the bridge structure uh, about two hours after the sinking. A sub the submarine had approached him to ask questions about the uh, wrecking and he did answer them because he thought they would, otherwise they would uh, kill him. Uh, but um, he did survive the war. After a whole week's leave, he was put back into the North Sea convoys. Um, went on and to have a family, and during the project, um, his daughter was located. Um, it's, been, it's been a really nice element of the project to be able to be in contact with her. She had an archive of letters and photographs. Many of the letters were from families of other crew members that perished during the loss, asking about the final moments and what had happened during the wreckage. Um, so quite a um, well, heart-rendering emotional archive, really. Um, and also the photographs which she's allowed us to scan and be made available. And she's taken great interest in the project. So it's been, a, it's been really gratifying to be able to uh, be in contact with her and give us information about her father's uh, work during the war. <clears throat> in terms of representing the really global nature of the conflict um, and the trading that was still ongoing uh, all through the war, um, I've just chosen the Camberwell. One of those 66% of the uh, cargo vessels within our data um, set. It had a long career from about 1903, transporting goods from the UK to a range of ports in India. And in fact, it was crewed largely, most of the 65 crew were from the Indian, Indian Merchant Service. During the wreckage, uh, seven um, sailors unfortunately drowned, um, all from the Indian Merchant Service. And we do have a booklet uh, which looks in more detail about the role of the Black and Asian seamen during the First World War more broadly, but the Campbellwell is one of these wrecks that is featured uh, within that booklet. The site was found in the 1970s by Martin Woodward, again another one off the Isle of Wight. Um, there was a number of artefacts raised at the time, um, but largely, as you can see from the geophysics, the site remains relatively intact on the seabed. One of the great resources at the National Archives have been the war insurance risk uh, records, which shows us often what was on all the sites, uh, who it belonged to, how much was paid out, the value of that cargo, uh, the loss of that cargo to the companies. And the Campbellwell is just, uh, just an amazing list of cargo items. Uh, we knew it was a mixed cargo, but it really was so mixed from the completely ordinary to I've just picked out some of the interesting and extraordinary items in there. Um, billiard table accessories, gramophones, football bladders, just showing what was still, um, right in the middle of the war, what was still being transported um, out to India. We also, as I mentioned, um, a number of artifacts raised back in the 1970s, some of them incredibly well preserved. Um, Ten rupee notes that have been freshly printed on the way to India, prepaid postcards for the troops in India to use to send back to Britain, just a whole host of material. And one of the great things we've been able to do is start linking some of the artefacts that we've recorded back, directly back to that uh, cargo list from the war risk insurance records. And it, there is a huge potential for much more research in this area to link those historical and archaeological records. <clears throat> 
I've added a glory in here. Now, this really does represent the domestic fishing fleet that was at work all through the war. Um, built in 1906 and operated its whole career from uh, Brixham. So fishing during the war, but there's also records of glory being used for um, providing trips for wounded First World War soldiers around the Tall Bay area during the war as well. So um, a, a different story that we hear about the war effort. We have records of 17 vessels that have left Brixham within our data set and sunk, um, and were sunk largely by submarines and didn't return. As these are largely wooden vessels with not much um, metal uh, fixtures and fitting on board, they're seldom found on um, the seabed. And so through recording some of these intertidal hulks, um, we have um, physical evidence of this smaller type of bricks and trawler that was in use during the war, um, for which we don't have those physical remains offshore um, at the moment. It's one of the sites where we've undertaken photogrammetry as a 3D model available online with an annotated tour for anyone wanting uh, to find out more about uh, glory and detail. <coughs> So, I've added the John Mitchell in here as representing one of the many steam fishing vessels which were requisitioned by the Admiralty. These were used in a whole range of activities to do with mine sweeping um, and clearing, using handling anti submarine nets, which was the John Mitchell's primary role, and doing patrols. About 1,300 of these were hired by the Admiralty, um, and we have about 40 lost within our study area. It's uh, was working out the pool when it was actually sunk following a collision. Um, you can see here the boilers on the site, a uh, wooden hull, so largely metal uh, features left. Again, not only a photogrammetry model, but we've also had a full virtual reality set up for this site. So it's been amazing to allow non-divers and people of all different abilities to actually physically experience a type of diving on these wreck sites. Um, Again, many of these resources are available online. I mentioned the commemorative aspects of what we're trying to do, and we always remember very much that behind every dot on the map um, there are people's stories. Huge um, loss of life at sea, um, and many, many stories of heroism and sacrifice. All of the troops that went to France, they all had an experience, they all went by sea, and so um, being on board boat, a maritime aspect played a role in their, the war stories of um, all of these individuals. And so we very much recognise the importance of telling their story. We've included these um, within the project in as many ways that we can. We've got a range of booklets on um, different topics. We've been very fortunate during the project to have an artist in residence, Mike Breeze, who has produced a huge number of um, illustrations for us. They've allowed us to provide a pictorial representation of aspects where there hasn't been any photographs or way uh, to commemorate or um, show many of these stories. And they've been used in all sorts of different project resources. We've also worked with the Imperial War Museum's Lives of the First World War project. This is an ambitious project that created a page for everyone that was involved in the war from the UK and right across the Commonwealth. They have an individual page, but they're also brought together in different communities as well. And so we have managed to create communities for 15 of the vessels that were lost within our study area. This one shows the war night, um, and likewise we saw earlier with the, um, with the uh, tanks of Paul. When you add these photos, we've been able to track down the photos of some of the individuals and bring their faces to the stories. I think that really does um, help bring this uh, commemorative aspect to the fore. <coughs> We've also been highlighting the Hollybrook Memorial. This is in uh, Southampton. It is the former <coughs> memorial for those lost at sea from the land and air forces. Um, they were many of those lost lives were lost on hospital ships um, or troop ships or merchant ships that those individuals that were travelling on. There's a hundred panels within this memorial um, with the names of those lost on 28 different vessels and two airships uh, within that uh, cemetery. We have uh, created a 3D, 3D tour, um, so you can uh, with, go and see the cemetery virtually. Um, we have a video, which was very kindly produced by uh, 
uh, the MS Steve Harvey, who's here. Um, and we also have a booklet, which I have many copies of with me today, if you'd like to take that away and uh, hear about the stories of the many different wrecks that were uh, commemorated at the cemetery. A brief look at some of the other aspects of the project and how we've been taking that story out to as many people and different audiences as we possibly can. The team, the project team has worked incredibly hard all across the south coast of Britain and beyond. We've had a public <coughs> outreach programme, uh, you can see here 207 events, over 30,000 people. That's involved taking our Discovery uh, bus out to events, um, undertaking a large talks programme. <coughs> We've worked with schools, um, both in a formal school setting and <coughs> informally. Um, we have produced uh, education resources as part of the project. Uh, we've taken them out into the intertidal zone as well, uh, giving them a different experience of uh, different types of uh, archaeological survey. And our touring exhibition programme, this was devised uh, to try and reach the biggest audience we could, <coughs> right across the south coast of Britain. So there's uh, five counties represented that we were dis um, taking our touring exhibition to. You see the display panels here, we took real artefacts um, with that, and bespoke panels for the location the different counties had different case studies on. So that was live for 177 months and has reached over half a million people along the south coast. Um, so we've been really pleased with the way that that uh, part of the project has worked. <clears throat> I've mentioned the input of volunteers during the project and that has been a really fundamental component. There were volunteers who brought their skills to the project and there were others that learned more st new skills during the project. In fact, we've got, we have many NES uh, members involved uh, volunteering with us, but also we've had a lot of new volunteers to Heritage as well. And that has helped with not only archaeological survey, but all sorts of data entry. They've recorded audio artifacts, art, articles, um, written rec stories, um, really a huge different ways in which people have been involved. Uh, we've had some really nice feedback uh, from volunteers about uh, their experience with the project. Um, we hope uh, they, that they continue to volunteer with us, but also that they can use their skills um, on other people's heritage projects and get involved uh, further afield. So just looking uh, to wrap up, um, we were very conscious of trying to produce a legacy from the project. Um, of course, the centenary is in theory over now, but we want the attention to really continue on the resources, so we've got a whole range list here of legacy resources available from our website. We also have legacy exhibitions where we brought that touring exhibition programme together, uh, one at the Shipwreck Centre in Maritime Museum on the Isle of Wight and one in Hearst Castle um, in Hampshire. Um, a lot of people have been asking me about um, what happens now. Well, the funding for this uh, project obviously has uh, finished. But uh, the database and the viewer is still a live resource. We're adding more details, uh, data to it. Um, in fact, we're really happy to hear from divers who might have photographs from some of those sites uh, that are in the data set that we don't currently have uh, within the viewer. Uh, we've got a number of photos from divers that we've added, of course, fully uh, credited. Um, and so we'd like to look at, look at how we've um, used that approach, um, how, what's worked well, potentially to extend that to further areas. Um, and also learn the lessons from what we've done here to potentially look forward to how we can work on and maybe commemorate some of the aspects of the Second World War um, in the future. But I think um, in terms of our project theme and, and providing uh, the future, a legacy for the future for uh, maritime archaeology, I hope the work we've done in interrogating these data sets in a way that hasn't been done before over such a large scale um, has produced this research resource that will be used by other people and be taken on to stimulate uh, work in the future. Um, I think it's been really interesting about how making the people stories very much personal stories has been important, whether that's through uh, being involved as a volunteer or a, fam a family connection. I think that's really sparked the interest of people um, who have then gone off and done their own research um, or become more actively involved. And so I think um, about uh, one of the lessons that we can very much learn uh, to help for the future uh, is linking people so directly to the heritage.